silts and sands uh, as we handle the sea, shifted back and forth, which it did. The shoreline, of course, shifted its position across Wyoming, and we could trace the shoreline. Here, the wrecks contain the remnants of the land life. And uh, it was during this time when vegetation began to take on this more modern aspect, uh, the medieval trees, the conifers, and the palms, what you will, uh, began to give way to the deciduous trees. And in later stages, we have oaks and elms and sycamores and sassafras, and what you will, some tropical world. And then, of course, we have uh, the great a uh, reptilian host, the dinosaurs, whose remains were entombed in them. When we go out to sea, we find oyster beds. And we know enough about oysters to know that they never uh, got ambitious and tried to leave the sea. If we go out here as we can and find an oyster bed within a few miles of Laramie, why, uh, we know, per adventure of a doubt, that the sea was here. You never saw an oyster climb a tree. In other words, a whole host of marine uh, organisms which are preserved as fossils. So, and then I might interest you too that much, not all, but much of uh, one of our great resources, or great heritages of our oil is entombed in uh, the reservoirs and in this marine succession, while uh, our coal, uh, which is derived from uh, the land living vegetation is consumed in this succession. So these rocks are especially significant because they play such a vital, significant part in our economy, and not only present but in the future, as uh, these vast coal resources, which seems 100 feet thick, uh, which is phenomenal. Pittsburgh became the center of the steel industry on a 10-foot coal seam, and yet, uh, we have scenes of uh, some petunias coal 100 feet thick. It's fantastic. Uh, it took probably 100,000 years for that one scene to come into being. <laughs> All right, now we're ready so much for Act 3. We're ready now for Act 4, okay, which is more spectacular, and that is the Cenozoic era. Uh, reaching from uh, some 60 uh, million years to the present. Well, now again, nature has shifted the vast burden of rock fragments from the highlands to the lowlands and built up here a sequence of rocks 30, 40,000 feet thick here over in this region, it's uh, 15,000 feet thick. Not further west, along the western border of the state, it's uh, nearly twice that thick. And we now are stretched apparently the capacity of the Earth's crust to support it. And something happens, hard to say what, except that another period of crustal unrest involves. And uh, we're going to throw now this great succession into a series of uh, wrinkles upwards and downwards, all of these, and all of the underlying rocks, of course, were involved in this. So we come out then with the major pattern, physical pattern, of the, of the Rocky Mountain region as we know it today. In other words, the upfalls become the mountain, mountain ranges, and the downfalls become the intermontane basins. So that the physical, major physical features as they evolved during this period of crustal unrest, on this, where we change now the pattern. Now, in it in the area of our interest, I can't take and draw out all of the, these folds, but to reaching from the Sire North Platte Valley, uh, to the west of us, to Cheyenne, the east of us, uh, there came into being two upwarps, two major upwarps, and uh, an intervening minor downwarp. 
Now all of these previously deposited rocks uh, were involved and uh, so we have here this succession aggregating in this region some 15,000 feet thick, three miles thick, sands and silt, what you will, laid down. Very thin veneer of the Paleozoic rocks, almost wanting because it was destroyed. And there may be a little coming in on our western border, but almost has uh, wanting. And beneath that, the uh, uh, highly contorted and folded and broken uh, basement complex, or the Precambrian rocks underlying everything with their intruded igneous uh, phases of granites and uh, a host of other. So we see now the rise of two upwards wrinkles and an intervening down warp in this area. And now inevitable, just as soon as these up warps broke base level, sea level, you see, ah, they were attacked. The inevitable erosion. And it wouldn't be long, in fact, the matter is probably the rate of uplift, we know nothing exact about it, uh, was relatively slow. But it wouldn't be long until these rather young and not too highly indurated rocks were uh, attacked and eroded, and we would have useful canyons cut on the flanks of these rising folds. And the uh, rock fragments, nature doesn't destroy them. She makes smaller fragments out of larger ones, but she transports them normally from the highlands, and they come to rest. And in as much as this down walk became a basin, now we call it the Laramie Basin, and this up walk to the east of us, and we'd say Laramie is located here. This would be the canvas. on the flank of the, we call this the Laramie Range, the Laramie Mountains. On the east end, these would be the Medicine Bowl Mountains on the west. In other words, the basic pattern now was the front. Now there starts to come into the picture a younger, younger succession of rocks which are locally derived. And uh, they're caught up in these basins as these drainage rivers poured out, as rivers have, uh, dump their inherited burden of rock fragments and we begin to get a younger succession of sediments, which now are laid down nearly horizontal, which is true of all the sediments, at the expense of the local highlands. In other words, not only that, but we find that uh, there were some places, there were lakes where these streams entered into and were caught up, and we had some spectacular lakes. Not so much right in this area as far the west of us. It's hard to visualize a lake covering 10,000 square miles in Wyoming, but we had them uh, during the early stages of this. In other words, we're now faced with this dual movements, compressional strains being thrown up, folding, and the inevitable attack down the up down. Now, at no time were these commensurate, probably. In other words, the uplift was uh, matched by the down cutting. It's conceivable, but it would take a very length. The uplift was more or less uh, what came uh, 
in uh, cycles, repeated, active, for a long period of time, and then quiescent, and another activity. But of course, the down cutting was constant. And as long as the water flowed downhill and the winds blew, uh, they down cutting. And these mountains began to lose of their substance, and the products of their thing were dumped into the adjacent base. So we began to build up then a sequence of uh, sediments uh, filling the uh, flanks of the rising fold. And now we also find a very marked change in the light. The dinosaurs which had run this region fairly without interruption for three score or more millions of years disappeared. One of the challenging thoughts, why? Why did this successful group of reptiles finally succumb? This big uh, copper-plated chap out here was one of the last. He doesn't look like he was on his way out, but he, he was the last. He, he didn't survive this revolution. In fact, they went down all over the world because this revolution was worldwide in its extent. Not only movements in the Rocky Mountain region, but in South America and elsewhere as well. They disappeared. There have been 20 ideas advanced as a cause of their disappearance. Probably they simply couldn't meet the competition of a changing world. Their food supply went as we had advanced and changed the character of the vegetation, and anyway, they just disappeared. And then coming into the picture and picking up their, uh, and now in the absence of the competition of these, uh, this horde of reptiles, we find the beginning of uh, the great mammalian class. The warm blooded vertebrates covered with hair uh, bring forth a young alive and suckle a young, much higher order. Powerful four chambered heart, body constant temperature, and so on. Uh, they had their beginnings in late Paleozo or late Cretaceous time, but apparently they got nowhere in the competition with the great reptilian horde. But as soon as the reptiles vanished, they took off, and we find as we go up through this succession, one of the most magnificent stories of evolution to be found anywhere, as we trace, for instance, the probably the best documented is the horse from a diminutive little animal that I could park within the, the space up to the horse we now know, tracing successfully. And in this, you might remember that if you have a succession of sequence of any objects superposed one on top of the other, you have established a time-space relationship. The floor is, table rests on the floor, the stand rests on the table, and the uh, box rests on the stand. You know, for adventure of a doubt, the floor is oldest in time. It had to be there before the table could be put upon it. So as we go up then, from the bottom of the sequence, we're going from the past to the present. In other words, that's a uh, version. If you start climbing a scarp, here's a uh, hill. And it's made up of a sequence of beds of rock. And you start down here at the bottom and start climbing. As you climb the sequence, you're going from the past to the present. In other words, this bed had to be in existence before this bed could be laid down upon it. The only alternative would be to turn the whole thing upside down, and that happens very, very rarely. It doesn't very really happen. In other words, the, it's, it's called the law of superposition. It means that younger rocks rest on older rocks. 